All right. Teachers, um, thank you for the way that you love on our children, for the sacrifice that you make, and for the way that you show them the love, the truth, and the grace of Jesus Christ. You may now lead them to Sunday school. As there, before we have prayer, um, I want to uh, just draw your attention to two other announcements. Number one, next Sunday we will celebrate baptism. And so if that's a step that you've been, God's been stirring in your heart, maybe you have questions about what baptism means, maybe you just know that I need to take that step of obedience, would you just see me after the service, send me an email, give me a call? Um, you know, my phone number is everywhere, so I get calls from all over the planet, so feel free to call me, okay? So if you don't have it, it's on the website, it's on the back of the, of the bulletin as well. But if, if God is prompting you about this important step, both of worship and of obedience and baptism, uh, we want to walk alongside you with that. And it's a great and beautiful celebration. So next week, we'll have both baptism and Lord's Supper, and it will be a wonderful, wonderful time together. And we're enjoying this time of, of summer. We get to see so many uh, wonderful visitors, and all of our congregation is on mission somewhere else on the planet. So with a few exceptions of us that are still here on mission. So yes, we're on mission, and the other three-fourths of the congregation are elsewhere on mission. Yes. Speaking of which, we've been talking in recent days a lot about the difference between going to church and being the church. And in my message today, we're going to explore some of what the scripture says about being the church. But one of the ways that Jesus instructs us to be the church is he tells us in Luke that we are to invite the poor, to, be, to have meals with them, to participate with them, to, to treat them with love and respect because they're made in the image of God and God loves them immensely. We're also instructed in the letters to remember the poor among us. And that's why we have ministries like Dignity that reaches out to the refugees. And we have several different homeless ministries, one of which um, that takes place on Saturday night is growing. Their need is, is getting stronger. And with so many people gone, they really need your help. And so um, especially if you're a Czech speaker, if you could help out with the homeless ministry on, um, on Saturday evenings, that would be fantastic. If you're not really a Czech speaker, you can still help out. There are lots and lots of ways to participate and to be a part. And in addition, we're building a, a pantry of supplies for this outreach for them to be able to be, um, make sure that no one goes away hungry. Because sometimes they have 50, sometimes you have 100. What's the most you've ever had, Carmina? 150, okay? So if, you're, if you only have supplies for 50, um, we, you know, the Lord can multiply those just like he did in the feeding of the 5,000, um, but if we give him a little more to start with, that's a good thing too, okay? So um, we want to make sure we at least have our five loaves and two fishes. So if you want to know more about that, you'll see on the screen, it's Ben and Carmina's email address, and I promise you, you will be blessed by serving in this way. Now, let me give you a, a side note, and this applies to all of our different ministries. When you get started, sometimes you really get excited and you have all kinds of great ideas, and you want to tell them, oh, we should do this, we should do this. Don't do that. <laughs> Just serve. And then after you get involved, you'll find out, oh, that's why they do this, or that's why this group does that. And then you'll be, you'll, you'll be able to see more of the picture. And so, I really want to encourage you to be, be a part. And so if, if you don't know who they are, I'm, I, they hate when I do this, but raise your hands. There you go. Okay, see? All right, Ben and Carmina, lead that ministry, and they need your help this Saturday. Uh, I won't make you raise your hand. Next week I will. So, unless we have a great response. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you for the incredible privilege it is to worship you. Lord, for the moments that we've been able to set aside the busyness of, of a week and of the activities that we have and just focus in on the greatness of you, of who you are, of your love for us, of the truth of your word. 
Lord, we ask that today that you would push away the distractions, all of them. Lord, I pray that you would enable me to get out of the way and that you would speak, that we would hear from your word in a powerful way and, Lord, that we would be changed because we've been in your presence. We give all honor, all praise, all credit to you. Lord, ask that you would show us what it means to be your church, to live as your presence in this world, united with other believers from, from all the nations, from all different denominations. Lord, help us to be united in you and to show others your grace and your truth. Thank you in advance for what you're going to do this day. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to, to think for a moment about your expectations of the church. You know, when you come, especially when you go to a new city, um, or maybe for those of you who are, who are visiting today, you have certain expectations of what you think church should be. And, and it usually includes a, 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 an array of programs. If you're going to be there with your family, you want to make sure it has a good children's program. You'd like to have some dynamic worship um, that's just right. Um, whatever that means, you know, just the right number of mix of hymns and choruses and, and not too much repetition, but enough repetition. You know, you want to make sure that you get all those things together, fit into the right box. Um, and maybe you come from a more liturgical background, and so you want the familiarity. But we have, as people, we have expectations of worship. You expect the sermon to be a little entertaining, um, hopefully informative, and definitely not too long. Right? Yet you're all laughing. And if I, this, see, my wife will, will admit the truth there. We have expectations, but here's the question we really need to ask. Because I've found, even though I, this is my 32nd year in full time ministry, I've not been very good about asking what God's expectations of his church are. Because you know the truth? All the things I just mentioned are none of the things he commanded the church to do. They're all good things. They're all wonderful things. They're important things. But sometimes in doing the activities and the programs, we can miss out on what he's actually commanded us to do and to be. So what are Jesus' expectations for us, his body, his church? What are God's expectations for the church? Well, the first one that Jesus emphasizes is in Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. In the Bible, love is only truly love when it is expressed. And the scripture gives us two directions Two ways to express our love. First of all, we express our love vertically in worship where we offer our bodies, our lives, our relationships, our careers, our everything that we are to God and say, Lord, I love you. You created me. I belong to you. I lay myself back on the altar and I say, I am yours. I love you. The second way that we express our love is horizontally in service, where we use our abilities, our spiritual gifts, our energies to help others both within the church and through the church to show the love, grace, and power of God and pour it out into people's lives. That's Jesus' first priority for his church that we love. In fact, he said, by this will all people know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. When the world doesn't see an accurate picture of the church, what we as the church need to do is not be critical so much of the media and of the world, but we need to examine in the mirror ourselves and determine whether or not we are truly loving one another as God has commanded us. Because the implication of Jesus is if we are not loving one another as Christ loved us, there's no reason for the world to recognize we're his followers. That's sobering. But it's true. Here are some of his other priorities. 
He says in John 17, be one in unity as God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. Love one another as I have loved you, he tells us in John 15, 12. Galatians 2, 10, remember the poor. Luke 14, 12 through 14, invite the poor and the broken in to relationship with you, to eat with you, to have fellowship and communion with you. Ephesians 4 that we've been looking at, use your spiritual gifts to build up one another. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18. Be holy as God is holy. Look after widows and orphans in their distress, James 1, 27. Make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28, 19. These are some of God's expectations, and there are many more. The truth is how we need to examine the church is based upon that first and foremost, and not based upon how many people come or how wonderful the programs are, but whether or not we are obeying the one who is our Lord and Savior. So with that background in mind, I want us to look at this passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 4 because it asks some very powerful, pointed questions to our heart. He gives us instructions and reminds us about who God is. And to start, I want to give a little bit of a little illustration. I want to remind you, um, God is incredibly gracious. But we sing about the grace of God, about the, the wonder that, uh, like it says in Zephaniah 317, that God sings over us. How incredible is that? But there's a danger to a certain degree when we emphasize grace of God too much that we can also forget He's holy. It's, it's like the joy of walking out into the sunset. And we see the beautiful colors that are, that are there as the sun pours forth its rays and it's bent by the atmosphere and we enjoy the beauty and the color. But we forget that if we look at the sun, directly at the sun, we go blind. And, and we forget the fact that if we were to actually be able to touch the sun, we would be instantly consumed. And the sun is 140 million kilometers away from earth. And yet its beauty and its power is also dangerous. How much more so the God who created it and created us. He is gracious and loving, but we must always remember he is holy. And to be in his presence in an unprepared un manner is spiritually dangerous. But God wants us to come. That's why he sent Jesus not only to save us, but to bring us into intimacy with him. That's what this passage we're going to look at is really all about. Ephesians 4, 24. Being in verse 24, he tells us to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Remember that phrase. Be angry and do not sin. And do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Here at ICP, one of our core values that we want to practice as a church is giving grace. And it comes from this verse right here. We are to give grace so that others can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. That they can respond to the conviction that he brings and the drawing that he brings to bring a person to faith in Jesus Christ. As a church, we've encapsulated those values, first of all, as loving God with all that we are based on the scripture. Secondly, living truth. We're not only to know the truth, 
We're not just to understand and grow in knowledge of the scripture, but what really matters is that which we live. That we live the truth out in such a way that it determines, God's word determines our identity, our value, our worth, and it determines the direction of our lives. We also are to give grace as God has given grace to us. And when we give grace, we are able then to walk together in unity in the Holy Spirit. Those four values come together, loving God, living truth, giving grace, and walking together in the Holy Spirit. When we practice that, we will be a church that honors the Lord and that he uses to show others who he is. Well, there's a chapter break right there after he says giving, giving grace to those who hear. And the chapter break to a certain degree does us a disservice as we're reading it because it is connected to the next verses. That's why it begins with therefore in chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That's our instruction. So here's an expectation that God has for us, for you and me as his presence in this world, as his body. The normal condition of a true follower of Jesus is one through whom the Holy Spirit is giving grace to those that we speak and interact with. In other words, we look like Jesus. That's what we're called to do. His expectation is that he wants to use you and I, not necessarily to preach a sermon, not necessarily to have all the answers and apologetics and to be able to answer and, to, and refute every question, but he wants us and expects us to speak grace into the lives of those around us so that they can hear. We were made to be united with God. That's what Jesus came to do for us. And that's why he tells us that our calling that we just read here in chapter 5, verse 1, our calling is to be like Jesus. For each and every one of us, that's the first step in understanding the will of God for your life. It may not answer the, the question about where you are to, to live, what job you're to have, who you're to marry, um, who you're to make friends with. Um, any of those kind of things, but it gives you the absolute core direction that should define everything else in your life, becoming like Jesus Christ. Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. How beautiful is that? Well, how did Jesus live as Jesus? Well, obviously he's God, and so it seems to us that that's unattainable, and certainly we can never measure up to the level of which he lived, but Jesus willingly humbled himself and lived in connection with and by the power of the Holy Spirit. He showed us that we can live like him through the filling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus lived continually connected to the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're called to do. We remember that he didn't begin his ministry until he was baptized, uh, not because he was a sinner in any way, he was sinless, but he was baptized to mark the beginning of his ministry and to show the point where he was then filled with the Holy Spirit as an example for us. That's what it tells us in Luke chapter 3, 21 through 22. Now, when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. If there's ever a reason, if you're wrestling with whether or not to, to, to be baptized, that should be your motivation right there. Because Jesus' baptism brought pleasure to the Father. If you want to please God, do what he tells you. It's as simple as that. It brings him pleasure. And how amazing is that, that you and I could bring the God of the universe, the creator of all things, joy. How amazing. 
But Jesus lived in that connection to the Holy Spirit. That's why he's continual about slipping away. When we read through his life and his ministry, Jesus is often going away by himself to be with the Father, to commune with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He's showing us an example of how we live a connected life to him. The love that the Father has for the Son is amazing. But through Jesus Christ, he has the exact same love for you. Exactly the same. Now, our passage, we're going to look at a very important subject here in Ephesians 4, verse 30. It says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Jesus didn't have to worry about being, about grieving the Holy Spirit because he lived in constant connection with him. The same is true for us. As we live connected to the Holy Spirit, we don't have to worry about grieving the Holy Spirit. And so that's my second point, is that God's designed for our life. He's called us to be like Jesus, and then he tells us that our connection, the power source to live a life like Jesus, is intimacy with the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus put it this way himself. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. The helper is the Holy Spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, when the disciples first heard that, they were, they were burdened because they didn't want to see Jesus go away. They were, had enjoyed three years of interacting with him on a personal basis, and the thought of him not being there was frightening. But Jesus is saying, I have something better for you. I'm going to place my Holy Spirit in you to be with you every moment in every circumstance, no matter what you face. That's a greater gift than us seeing and walking like the disciples did in the footsteps of Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes to live within us and seals us for the completion of our adoption, the day of redemption. But with that, the one true fear that you and I, as followers of Jesus, if you place your trust in him, the one fear that we should have would be to grieve the Holy Spirit. To act in such a way, to have an attitude in such a way that we wound that relationship. There's something very touching about this admonition. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. It doesn't say, do not make him angry. It's more delicate. It's more tender. The term grieve here is a a combination of anger and love that is intermingled together. It is anger because there's something broken, but there is love because there is still a connection. When you think about it, the most powerful emotion you and I or anyone can ever face is grief. If you've gone through the loss of a loved one, you understand how consuming grief is how it encapsulates every other emotion. What he's saying here is that God is so connected to you and I that when there's a, a break in the relationship, what he feels is grief because he longs for you and I to come closer. But there's a separation because of disobedience, because of willfulness, because of sin. We need to understand that what we're seeing here is is living out a truth that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let me remind you of this. In verse 12, it says this, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. 
The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But look at the last phrase. But we have the mind of Christ. What he's saying there is when we have the mind of Christ is that God has not only invited us into a relationship where we have salvation and where we look forward to uh, a relationship in heaven, but he's saying, I've given myself, my presence to you to transform you. I want to give you my thoughts. But it's not just my thoughts. He wants to give us his emotions, his experience, his connection. In the Holy Spirit, we experience intimacy with God that transcends all the human emotions, joy, sorrow, hope. God wants you to be connected to him. But what are the things that grieve God? Now, if we're, as we read through this passage, if, if I was to ask you that question without you looking at the passage, chances are the first thing that would come to your mind, you would probably list things like certain types of immorality or maybe a greed or an injustice, right? That's the first thing that comes to our mind. We think about moral things um, partly because of the, of, the, of the teaching throughout history that there's some kind of difference between uh, meni- I don't even know what the term is. Sorry, venial sins and what's the other one? What? Mortal. Mortal. Okay, thank you. I, I should know that. I'm like a pastor. Uh, but sometimes my brain goes, goes south on me. And God doesn't distinguish things that way. In fact, what he says grieves him the most is brokenness in our relationship with one another. Did you see what it said? Ephesians 4, 29 Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Our words to one another, if they're not building others up, grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, let me try to illustrate this to you the, the best way I'm able to understand it. Um, I, I have the privilege of being a father. Becky and I have four wonderful children, and um, soon we'll have a seventh grandchild on the way. <laughs> Actually, I don't think we're supposed to say that yet, but too bad. It's, it's, it's Micah's birthday, so that's my present to him. Here's the thing. One of the weightiest things that can happen to you as a parent is to have your children quarreling. When they're not getting along, when, they're, when two sisters, like those two right there, my wife and, and her sister, when they're arguing, it breaks mom and dad's heart because you love both of them immensely. There's not a competition and your heart is broken because it feels like no matter what, you lose if you can't bring them into reconciliation. That's how God feels about us, his children, his sons and daughters. When we're divided, when we're tearing one another down, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And it affects us. When you've done something wrong, Part of what God has built into us in our conscience, if it's not seared and calloused, is that there will be a sense within us that that there's something out of sorts. There'll be that bad feeling inside. For a believer, that's not just your conscience. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit pushing you to come back to him, to turn away from that broken relationship or from that attitude, or from that action. He's inviting us back into intimacy because he doesn't want the grief in our relationship to remain. God's voice communicates with us directly, and it will continually, as you cultivate your relationship with him, and you ask the Lord, Lord, how do you see me? How am I doing? Where are areas where I'm grieving you? 
That may be one of the most important questions for us to ask is in prayer, Lord, show me if there's something that I'm doing, an attitude that I have that brings you grief instead of joy because I love you. He says, corrupting talk, that which brings shame or, sound, or sounds um, demeaning to the soul. What he's saying is that our words can be a roadblock to God's grace. Remember the contrast is that we're to live in such a way, we're to give grace in such a way so that others can hear. So if I'm not speaking grace, not only am I interfering with my relationship with the Holy Spirit, but my words that are harsh, that are judgmental, may be preventing you or others from coming into greater intimacy with God. That's sobering. That should frighten us. But the good news is it doesn't have to define us. This grief is something that is more intense than just anger. It's more, it's deeper than disappointment. Psychologists consider divorce to be parallel to grief. The brokenness of a relationship penetrates every aspect of your thoughts, of your life. And for children of divorce, they're torn between two that they love and it breaks their hearts. This is the kind of grief the Spirit is talking about here. Our sin grieves God. Our unbelief grieves God. Our ingratitude grieves God. Our unfaithful hearts grieve God. What he's saying very specifically here is that our hurtful words and actions towards others grieves God. I don't want to be there. I don't want to suspend my connection with the Holy Spirit. So I'm asking him continually to make my heart soft, to make me sensitive to his voice so that we can live in a way that brings him joy. Because here's what happens. When we grieve the Lord, our intimacy will be broken. Um, we'll live life, but the presence of God will not feel the same. We won't feel like he's with us. And when the spirit of God goes away from our soul and suspends his work within us, we become more and more miserable. In fact, the most miserable person on the face of the earth is not a great sinner. It's one who is saved who's grieved the Holy Spirit. Now, it's, it's miserable because God will use that misery to bring you back to joy in him. He'll allow us to be miserable because he loves us enough that he wants us to have his presence. And what happens is He's no longer speaking his instructions into our heart and into our life. We read the word, but we can't understand it because the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit is no longer speaking. We fall on our knees and we ask, but we seem to get no answer and learn nothing. Here's how Charles Spurgeon puts it. He suspends his comfort. We used to dance like David before the ark, and now we sit like Job in the ash pit and scrape our ulcers with a, with a piece of pottery. There was a time when his candle shone round about us, but now he is gone. He has left us in the blackness of darkness. Now he takes from us all spiritual power. He goes on to say, we go preaching, and there's no pleasure in preaching. There's no good that follows it. We go witnessing, and to Sunday school, and to our other activities, but we might as well be at home. The machinery is there, but there is no love. There is no intention to truly do good, to truly bless others. There is no power to accomplish what we've been called to do. The Lord has withdrawn himself, his light, his joy, his comfort, his power. That's why I say this is the one true fear that we as a follower of Jesus should have. David expressed it this way in his great psalm of repentance in Psalm 51. He says this, 
Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and listen, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. But then it turns into a petition. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. See, that's how our God is. He wants us to quickly recognize where we've gone astray and simply turn around and say, Lord, would you restore me? I'm messed up bad. And maybe there's some some forgiveness I need to ask of others. Lord, first I ask it of you. And our God in his incredible grace doesn't make us go through great um, ordeals to try to pay for what we've done. Jesus already did that. He simply says, come home. How cool is that? That God just says, yeah, I know you've been out there doing your own thing, just like the prodigal. But guess what? I'm looking for you to turn around, and when you turn around, I'm running out there with a robe and a ring and sandals for your feet and an embrace to welcome you home. That's our God. He's amazing. Well, David's not the only one who saw it this way. This is what God said about Israel. And these are, this is sobering to me because this can happen not only to a nation in Israel, it can happen to a church. It can happen to us. It says this in Isaiah 63, verse 10, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. How sobering is that? So what do we do? What's the instruction that God gives us? Well, instead... He tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to see that come up in in the messages ahead. We'll, We'll talk more about what that means. He wants us to imitate God, to give our heart to him, and to recognize how vital our connection to the Holy Spirit is. Let me give you some things about what we lose, really, when when we bruise this relationship, when we grieve the Holy Spirit. We should be fearful of breaking the connection to the Holy Spirit because he is our helper and without him we are powerless. That's what we see in John 14, 15. He says in verse 16, I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, he guides us. We should fear breaking our connection with the Holy Spirit because he is the spirit of truth and he's the one that helps us determine what is right and what is wrong, to be able to set the course of our life. John 14, 26 tells us, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. He's not only our helper, he's our teacher. He's the one who equips us and enables us to learn all the things that God has for us to accomplish what he's called you to do. Can I encourage you that whatever your job is, whatever your career is, whatever your um, relational struggles that you may have are, the place to begin isn't first and foremost to go and take a new class on that. that. That may be helpful and that may be what you need to do eventually, But you have the greatest wisdom, the greatest instructor in all the universe dwelling within you. Ask him to teach you. Here's here's the great news. God knows accounting better than any accounting firm. He knows retail better than retail lures. He knows any... (laughs) I recently, I, I passed my check driving license. Hallelujah. Praise God. I continue to pray that the Lord will teach me to drive in a country filled with people who drive differently than I do. I'll just put it that way. Show me how to drive when they're double and triple and parked. Show me how to drive. He's our teacher in every area. It, If you need wisdom, he says, come to him. But what is more, John 14, 27 says that he is our peace. 
peace I leave with you. When Jesus says, my peace I give to you, it wasn't just a gift. It was the person of the Holy Spirit. Peace is a person. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and he said, I want my spirit to live within you to give you peace in any circumstance you're in, no matter what you face. So what's the condition then? If if we're to live connected, what's the condition that God gives us? Well, in John 14, 15, Jesus made it really clear, if you love me, you will keep my commandments And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Obedience to Jesus is directly linked to our connection to the Holy Spirit. If I'm disobeying disobeying what God has already told me to do, then chances are I'm already grieving the Holy Spirit, or at least I am not living in a way where the fullness of his presence can truly work in and through my life. And that's the command that God gives us. He says to abide in his love in John 15. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit as well. And that your joy may be full. Well, that's the command. That's what we're to do. We're to love as God loves us because he goes on to reinstate his commandment that we love one another as he has loved us. Greater love has no one than he lays down his life for his friends and you are my friends. But there's a caution for the Holy Spirit. That's what we see in the rest of these verses and we'll wrap up here in just a few moments. The caution of the Holy Spirit is division. A few years ago at our church in Colorado, we, had a, we invited an, an organized atheist uh, group in for a dialogue. And, and it was a really, it was just a wonderful event because it was just, it was just very authentic. I mean, we allowed them to t- tell, tell us all the things that they thought Christians were stupid about and the, the things that they wrestled with. And they shared their views, the things that they, they believed and and. Um, and what, but what stood out to me um, from that and from the relationships that I had with several of them uh, over, over a period of time was that in almost every case, one of the reasons, one of the core reasons why they were an atheist or at least agnostic in their circumstance was because they had been wounded in some way by the church or by those who professed to follow Jesus Christ. The words of others had been used by the enemy to turn them away from God. Now, they were still responsible for their unbelief, for their turning away, but it was heartbreaking to see how many times that common denominator was repeated. That somehow they'd been wounded. You remember our exercise from last week? We're going to do it one more time because I... I, I want, you to, I want you to try it again. Maybe you'll do better this time. So let's go ahead and put, there you go. All right, I want you to say the color of the letters. All right, everybody ready? Say them out loud. Green, red, blue, yellow, blue, green, blue. Now you're just making noise. It's hard, isn't it? When what we say doesn't match what we see, it causes frustration. That's what happens to the people around us. When what they see in us doesn't match what we say, they're frustrated. And it turns their eyes away from Jesus. The Holy Spirit is grieved when our actions and our words cause divisions and keep people from experiencing the grace he wants to show through us. All the sins against the Holy Spirit that we find in this portion of Scripture of Ephesians are sins that hurt others. It is the tool of Satan to cause division 
but the Holy Spirit calls us to build up one another. And that's the solution. When you and I become determined to be agents of grace, to build up others, God will do amazing, amazing things. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And he goes on, and he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. These are all sins of relationship. Division is caused by lies, it tells us in verse 25. Instead, we are to be proactive in our words and to seek to build others up, to speak the truth in love in such a way that we see God working in them and we want to encourage that, not tear them down. Division is also caused by unrestrained anger, we see in verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Emotions are like fuel. They're like petrol. They can power an engine or they can set a blaze that is explosive. So don't let your emotions cause division. Weigh out, measure your emotions and your words carefully towards one another. Also, division is caused by laziness. We see in verse 28, he says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone who is in need. Christ calls us to be servants as he humbled himself and served. Not to be self-oriented. It's not loving. And then in verse 27, we see that the ultimate source of division is Satan. He's seeking to work through us. He says, give no opportunity to the devil. And his primary tactic is division. We just need to remember that. When there's division, Satan is always at work. Many other people may have contribute to what's causing the division, but he's in the midst of it. And verse 29 tells us division is caused by judging. Don't let corrupting, that which would destroy another person's spirit or soul, come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up. And then finally, division is caused by unforgiveness. Verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. I don't know if you memorize scripture or not, but let me encourage you, if you don't, to memorize this verse. I believe it is perhaps one of the most concise and powerful verses in the scripture to show us how to live. I have done more weddings than I can count, and I always end with this verse. This is my instruction for how husbands are to treat their wives and wives are to treat their husbands. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Let that sink into your mind. Meditate on it. Memorize it. Better yet, live it. So how do we walk like Jesus? Well, I believe that verse gives us the instruction along with the next two verses that follow Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. To walk like Jesus, we walk in kindness to one another. To walk like Jesus, we choose to be tender-hearted towards each other, to look for the needs of others, to see them as God sees them, not as an obstacle or a frustration, but as an opportunity for God to work. Thirdly, be forgiving to one another. We all are gonna make mistakes. We're all gonna say things that we regret, say things that we didn't even know were hurtful, 
be forgiving to one another as God has forgiven us in Christ Jesus. And then love like Jesus. Choose to be an imitator of him. Well, that's my deepest prayer. Would you show us how to walk in love as Jesus did? In integrity, in humility, so that others may see him. Jesus has set us free from sin so that we can be like him and be continually connected to the Holy Spirit so that his grace may flow through your life outwards towards others and build them up. Bring them the joy of the Lord. We have been set free in Christ Jesus, free to walk like Jesus, continually connected to the Holy Spirit, giving grace to others. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that you would show us now how to live it. Lord, not, not to just allow it to be words that we saw on a screen or on a page or words that we heard, but words that change us, that we live. Lord, we ask that you would pour out afresh your Holy Spirit upon us. Lord, you poured out your Holy Spirit on the early church because they were seeking you and because they were of one accord. They were united together. So Lord, we ask that you would unite us together in you as your church. Lord, under the name of Jesus, make us one and unite us with the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that as you poured out your spirit in the New Testament, that you would do it again right here in Prague that you would bless the churches of Prague, the believers in Prague, that you would bring a revival beginning in each of our own hearts. Do it again, we ask, for your honor, for your glory. Thank you, Lord, for what you're gonna do. Reveal to us, Lord, areas where we've been disobedient to you, where we've grieved the Holy Spirit. And Lord, call us back to yourself. Give us the faith to respond, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.